May 1st, 1960. An American high-altitude U-2 spy plane is conducting a covert reconnaissance flight over the Soviet Union in order to photograph Soviet ICBM sites. The United States believes the U-2 aircraft's altitude is beyond reach of Soviet radar and air defenses. They're about to learn just how wrong they are. A Soviet SAM site fires several of the state-of-the-art S-2 guideline surface-to-air missiles that's more than capable of reaching the aircraft. The U-2 is hit and its pilot, Francis Gary Powers, ejects and is subsequently captured. The shootdown would spark an international incident that severely damaged U.S.-Soviet relations. To understand the larger implications of the incident, we have to look at the U.S.-Soviet relationship of the mid to late 1950s, the proliferation of nuclear arms, and the world of espionage during these early days of the Cold War. First, let's examine the changing relationship between the United States and Soviet Union during this period. The death of brutal Soviet dictator Joseph Stalin in March of 1953 led to a power struggle. Out of this came Nikita Khrushchev, who had been a political commissar and close advisor of Stalin. Stalin had promoted and implemented a harsh and repressive government where dissidents was punished by being sent to labor camps or imprisoned in gulags, and he also formed a cult of personality around himself. With Khrushchev came major changes in the USSR. One of the first things he did was begin releasing many political prisoners from Stalin's reign. He also denounced Stalin and his policies in a 1956 speech that shocked many in the Soviet Union and in the West. He also relaxed many of the repressive elements of Stalin's government that allowed greater freedoms to the Soviet people. Khrushchev pursued cultural exchanges with the United States in the form of academics traveling to Wonders universities and allowing various Western media to be allowed into the Soviet Union. Khrushchev's foreign policy was also a major departure from Stalin. Khrushchev believed in peaceful coexistence. This was the idea that the United States and the capitalist West could coexist with the communist Soviet Union and Eastern Bloc without having to fight one another, especially with the growing risk of nuclear war. These changes in the Soviet Union were contrasted in the United States with the election of Dwight Eisenhower as the 34th President of the United States. Eisenhower was most well known as the Supreme Commander of the Allied Forces in the West during World War II and this popularity helped lead him to the White House. One of Eisenhower's first major moves was to help negotiate the Korean Armistice in July of 1953, just six months into his term. This ended the Korean War and remains in effect to this day, albeit tentatively at times. Like Khrushchev, Eisenhower realized the importance of making strides to reach some form of detente with the opposing side. This led to both leaders traveling to Geneva, Switzerland in 1955 for a summit where they were able to meet one another and form a personal relationship as well as break the ice on issues such as trade, arms control, and issues of proliferation of nuclear arms. One topic of discussion was an Open Skies Treaty proposed by Eisenhower that would allow the U.S. and USSR to conduct unarmed surveillance flights over one another to inspect ICBM sites. This was rejected by Khrushchev. This successful summit led to Vice President Richard Nixon making a state visit to the Soviet Union in July of 1959 as part of a cultural exchange between the two superpowers. The most important result of this visit was a reciprocal invitation to Khrushchev to visit the United States, which he did that September for 13 days. Khrushchev's visit to the U.S. was a major milestone in U.S.-Soviet relations at this point for many reasons. For one, Khrushchev was the first Soviet leader to visit not only the United States, but the Western Hemisphere in general. Khrushchev also brought his wife and four adult children on the trip, which was another unprecedented move. Khrushchev would have numerous meetings with Eisenhower, as well as visit several major cities, including New York, while engaging in conversations and debates over the merits of capitalism and communism. The success of the visit led Eisenhower and Khrushchev to schedule a summit in Paris in May 1960, with Eisenhower expected to visit Moscow later that year as well. While these diplomatic changes were ongoing, the risk of nuclear war still remained. The Soviets had tested their first nuclear weapon in 1949 and both sides began rapidly expanding and advancing their arsenals. The advent of hydrogen bombs greatly increased the destructive potential of a nuclear war and intercontinental ballistic missiles increased the means by which to deliver these weapons. 
In addition, more advanced aircraft were also developed to increase the success of weapon delivery in the event of war. This nuclear arms race led to the need for information. Both sides were in a constant struggle of trying to determine the progress of their opponent. The Soviets had large-scale human intelligence assets within the United States. While some of these were captured, such as the Rosenbergs, Morton Sobel, and Rudolf Abel, many weren't and successfully passed numerous nuclear and technical secrets to the Soviet Union. The United States had some human intelligence assets in the Soviet Union, but not nearly to the extent that the Soviets did in the United States, at least not in available information. The U.S. also had limited intelligence on Soviet facilities located deep inside the country near the Ural Mountains and had no way to surveil them with current aircraft and satellites were years away from being available to do the job. This led to the development of the U-2 spy plane by Lockheed to fill that role. The U-2 was designed to fly at extremely high altitudes in excess of 70,000 feet while being able to take detailed photographs. This was done knowing that contemporary Soviet surface-to-air missiles and fighter aircraft could not reach it, and the U.S. believed it would be beyond the range of Soviet radar as well. This would allow the U.S. to take photographs of Soviet ICBM facilities undetected since violating the USSR's airspace could be seen as an act of war. The planes also had an extremely long range, being able to fly for thousands of miles in a single sortie. President Eisenhower approved reconnaissance flights over the Soviet Union that were to be planned and carried out by the CIA. The first of these flights was completed in July of 1956, and the next four years would see intermittent flights done over the USSR. What the United States did not know was that the Soviets knew about the flights. They had picked them up on radar but had no way of intercepting them. The Soviets couldn't reveal the presence of American spy planes without also revealing their inability to stop them, so they stayed silent on the issue. The Soviets also had a spy located in Boda, Norway, which is where many of these U-2 flights would either land or take off from, giving further insight to the ongoing surveillance missions. To counter these high-altitude surveillance flights, as well as new high-altitude American bombers, the Soviets developed the SA-2 surface-to-air missile system. Development on the system began in 1953, and by 1957, they began deploying these new SAM sites around the USSR. U.S. flights were intermittent, and one that occurred in early April 1960 was detected by the Soviets, but the aircraft did not fly over any of the new SA-2 sites. Despite a planned summit in Paris, France between the U.S., U.K., USSR, and France that was scheduled for May 15th, President Eisenhower approved a U-2 flight over the Soviet Union scheduled for late April. The flight was scheduled for April 30th but was delayed one day because of bad weather in the Soviet Union over the target areas. The Soviets were tipped off about the impending flight and ordered all of their air defenses in Central Asia to go on high alert. On May 1st, Powers took off in his U-2 from an airbase in Peshawar, at Pakistan. His planned flight route was to travel over the central portion of the Soviet Union, photographing ICBM sites and other points of interest, before traveling north and then west before landing at Boda, Norway. Shortly after crossing into the Soviet Union, Powers was detected, and the Soviets scrambled numerous squadrons to intercept, though none of the aircraft could reach him. Halfway through his planned route, Powers and his aircraft fell within range of a SA-2 battery. The SAM site fired a volley of three missiles at Powers, with the first of these detonating around 200 feet from his aircraft, but the proximity was close enough to damage the plane enough to bring it down. Powers bailed out of the aircraft and survived the landing and was later captured by the Soviets. A MiG-19 that was pursuing Powers was struck by another SA-2 missile and its pilot was killed. Khrushchev knew that they had caught the United States red-handed for spying on the Soviet Union. He decided to hold off on saying anything about the shootdown in order to see what the Americans would say first. Four days after the incident, on May 5th, an official cover story was released by NASA claiming that a U-2 had gone missing north of Turkey and that the pilot was presumed dead. It was claimed that the aircraft was conducting a weather research mission. A U-2 was painted in a NASA color scheme as part of the ruse and it appears that the U.S. government did genuinely believe that Powers had been killed. 
The cover-up also alleged that the pilot had radioed about oxygen difficulties and that they believed the pilot may have gone unconscious, which led to the crash. Khrushchev now saw the opportunity to score major political points on the United States, especially as President Eisenhower began to face criticisms from the political opposition in the U.S. Khrushchev subsequently released that the Soviet Union had in fact shot down the U-2, but withheld any information on the pilot. The U.S. still tried to push the NASA cover story by stating that the pilot must have gone unconscious and the plane had its autopilot turned on and drifted into Soviet territory. Khrushchev then released the most damning information of all. The pilot, Francis Gary Powers, was alive and well, and he also released numerous photos of the U-2, including its highly sensitive cameras that showed that the plane had but one purpose, espionage. President Eisenhower was now faced with mounting political pressure at home. His only two options were to admit to his knowledge and approval of the U-2 flights and damage any hope for positive relations with the Soviet Union or deny any knowledge and look weak and ineffective on the domestic front. On May 11th, Eisenhower not only acknowledged the U-2 flights over the USSR, but he also acknowledged his direct role in approving each of the missions, including the Powers flight. The Paris summit continued as planned, but there was no longer any hopes of productive meetings between the two superpowers. Khrushchev still presented his peaceful coexistent beliefs, but he too was facing political pressure to take a hardline stance against the United States. As talks broke down, Khrushchev also uninvited Eisenhower from the planned trip to Moscow. For the U-2 pilot, Powers would be convicted of espionage by the Soviets and was sentenced to three years in prison, followed by seven years of hard labor. In February of 1962, Powers would come home after the United States and Soviet Union agreed to a trade that sent Rudolf Abel back to the USSR in exchange for Powers. This negotiation and part of the U-2 incident are portrayed in the movie Bridge of Spies. The incident ended any hopes for a detente between the U.S. and Soviet Union throughout the 1960s. In fact, the 60s would see U.S.-Soviet relations reach their lowest of lows. In 1961, construction of the Berlin Wall would begin, and then, in 1962, we would see the world get pushed to the brink of World War III during the Cuban Missile Crisis. This sharp decline began with the downing of a single aircraft. I hope you found this video informative, and if you did, please leave a like. Thank you for all the recent support, and I'll see you on the next one.